Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. Before we dive in today, there are lots of important announcements on the front page of your program. Uh, we're all about people getting connected here. Right? Don't do life alone. Right? Get plugged in. Uh, women's breakfast potlucks. I always like to show up at the end of those ones. Right? Uh, <laughs> middle school, winter camp, life group opportunities. So please fill out a connect card and put that in the uh, offering basket in the back if you would like more information or need prayer for anything. I also want to draw attention to our volunteer appreciation and vision night. So if you volunteer here in any capacity, uh, we want to say thank you uh, as well as kind of cast vision for the future. And we would love to have you there. Uh, if you can come, please RSVP by using the QR code uh, in your program. And if you don't know how to do that, uh, talk to a millennial <laughs> or a Gen Zer. Well, we are in a series through 1 Corinthians called Better Church of Paul's letter, and we're continuing our emphasis on relationships, uh, sex, marriage, divorce, uh, uh, real light topics, right? And uh, after my Freudian slip last week, <laughs> I'm relieved to know, you might be relieved to know, I still have a job here. <laughs> Every couple of years, I get off script, I say something that's stupid, uh, Three years ago, I accidentally combined Trump's election and insurrection and said a word you never want to hear your pastor say. Uh, you could figure it out if you want to. Um, but yeah, yikes. One of my biggest fears is saying stuff like that up here. But uh, love this church. Love that you guys uh, came back. <laughs> we learned last week that marital sexuality is a good thing. The Bible is not shy or prudish about it but how sex can also be a kind of check engine light on the health of our uh, relationship. Today, we're gonna continue to talk about healthy and unhealthy marriages. And again, I wanna encourage those of you who are not married that to, to not check out, to not walk out. Uh, today is for you too, because all scripture is for you and for me. We will be talking about singleness next week, but even today, singles, there's a word for you. Maybe you'd like to be married one day, and so this is preparation. Uh, maybe, well, we've all been impacted by the breakdown of marriages, so this teaching could be empowering for you. And finally, single person, you have people in your life who are married that need your help and support and prayer. Like, we need each other. Uh, we're God's family. So if you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? 1 Corinthians 7 Verse 6, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it's better to marry than to burn with desire. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy." But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's uh, read this prayer of confession together. I think we have that confession in there, right, Joan? Okay, let's read this prayer of confession together, which will be a little different than what we normally do. Almighty God and loving Father, we thank you for placing us in covenant relationships, in homes and families and friendships. Forgive us for taking our vows and promises lightly. Forgive us for the breakdown of family life, for misdirected love and for divorces entered lightly, for failing to give time to our families, for failing to teach and live by your values, for neglecting our children. Jesus, our heavenly brother, Teach us every day to love and serve, to cherish and protect those with whom we live. In your name we pray, amen. 
Let me share the good news over us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The new life has begun. So know that in Jesus, God embraces you, forgives you, strengthens you to live a renewed life. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Last week, we looked at how there was a group in the Corinthian church. Uh, Some scholars call them the eschatological women, the end times women. Uh Uh-oh, right? And uh, they looked at the sexual craziness of their culture and said, enough is enough. Sex is bad, even in marriage, and even marriage itself, it's unnecessary. And it seems like some of these spouses felt the permission or even the obligation to divorce their spouses, especially if they weren't Christian. So Paul is quite the mess to clean up, Uh, addressing things with such pastoral nuance and care that we don't really see anywhere else in his his letters. It's 40 verses long in chapter 7. And and it does require pastoral nuance and sensitivity because, as you know, divorce is messy and complicated and painful and difficult. One of the saddest parts of my job is watching marriages fall apart. I've walked with many of you. I've walked with many of your children through difficult divorces. And I've heard even more of your stories, right? Just horrible marriages, ugly divorces, family chaos. And of course, for all the stories I've heard from you, there's several more I haven't heard. Uh, We've all experienced this. If not personally, then someone close to us. Some of you are probably maybe even going through this right now. Now, in the church today, there are really two big lies, I think, that we've believed or fostered about divorce. And lie number one would be something like, divorce is no big deal. Do whatever makes you feel happy and liberated. And if we believe this lie, we're just like the world in our experience of, of, uh, of marriage and sexuality. It makes me think of a funny satirical Babylon Bee article. Uh, Above and beyond, man is such a fierce proponent of traditional marriage that he's participated in four of them. (laughs) We might be real critical of of same-sex marriage, and and I think we should be, but we need to get our own house in order in some of these areas as well. We need to promote healthier marriages in these four walls, right? To repent of the ways we've contributed to the breakdown of our marriages. But the other error in the church, lie number two, would be something like divorce is the worst sin ever. Uh, divorce can sometimes be treated with a lot of shame and stigma in the church, like you're a failure or maybe a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. Uh, someone even before the service saw what I was teaching on and kind of talked to me about that. I do think that's changing a little bit, um, I, I hope and, and pray. Many of you have gone through divorce, and sadly, the church made things worse. And if that was your experience, man, I'm so sorry. Theologically, we have to be able to hold two truths in tension. One, that God's ideal for marriage is lifelong permanence. And two, we live in a broken and fallen world. So the church should be a place that unapologetically defends and advocates and fights for healthy marriages, and a place of Radical hospitality and healing for those who've gone through painful divorces, right? So we need a lot of help in this area, don't we? Let's see what Paul has to say. So in verse 6, he says, I say this as a concession, not a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am, but if they do not have self-control, they should be married, for it's better to marry than burn with desire. So in other words, it's not a command to get married. You don't have to get married. Paul isn't, Jesus wasn't. Marriage is a good thing, but not for everyone and not in every season. Paul even says, heck, I wish everyone was single like me. I'm kind of enjoying it. But marriage is a gift, says Paul. Singleness is a gift. All of life is a gift. So today we're going to look at the prohibition of divorce the reasons for divorce, and the antidote to divorce. So first, the prohibition of divorce. Verse 10. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, 
She must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. So who's the Lord in verse 10? Sunday school answer works here, guys. Jesus, well done. Okay, the, uh, Jesus is the Lord. And so, yeah, what do the red letters say? If you didn't grow up in church, uh, you might not know that some Bibles put the words of Jesus in red font. How many of your Bibles have red letters with Jesus? Okay, so a good, good chunk of us. Um, I, I, in the past, not really been a fan of red letter Bibles because like all of the words are God's words, even Leviticus. Uh, but, but Paul does, Paul challenges me in this area. He does put a special priority, a special emphasis on Jesus' words uh, in a way that challenges me. So let's bring those red letter Bibles back, right? Make red letter Bibles great again. I don't know. Like, too soon? Too soon? <laughs> but there is something so central, so special about the words of Jesus, the red letters. So what do the red letters say about divorce? Jesus says in Matthew 19, 9, I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, oh, you can't really see those red letters, huh? Sorry about that. <laughs> I tried. Um, yeah, interestingly enough, I think the issue of divorce is the one issue where Jesus sides with the more conservative Pharisees. Uh, the more liberal school taught divorce for any and every reason, including uh, your spouse burning dinner. And I'm not making that up. That's like literally one of the reasons given. Now notice that Jesus only addresses the men. In Jesus' ministry, in Jewish culture, a divorce was almost always initiated by men. But in Roman culture, so in, in, in Corinth, divorce could be initiated by men or women. And of course, like Roman culture, uh, our own culture is almost the opposite of Jesus' context. Did you know over 70% of divorces are initiated by women? And we'll talk about maybe why that is in a second. But Jesus' teaching is simple. Uh, if you're married, Jesus says, stay married. Uh, don't divorce your spouse. You made a promise to stay married until death do us part. But the Corinthians had an important follow-up question. Maybe you have important follow-up questions too. But we'll talk about theirs first. Uh, they were wondering, well, what if my spouse is not a Christian? Uh, does following Jesus mean leaving my non-believing spouse? Paul says in verse 12, But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, If any brother has an unbelieving wife and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. So Paul says, not I, but, or, not the Lord, but I. So there's no red letters for this question. Jesus never had to deal with this problem. So Paul kind of builds and expands off Jesus' teaching to address a new context. So he says, hey, if you become a Christian and your spouse doesn't, but they want to stay married, then stay married. Verse 14, for an unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So this doesn't mean that your spouse automatically becomes a Christian when you become a Christian. Uh, but what it means is if, if you stay, you'll have a holy, healthy influence on your spouse, on your home, uh, on your children if you have them. And then verse 16 is aspirational. Wife, for all you know, you may save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. Uh, they might come to know Jesus because of you. Uh, watch God work miracles in your marriage, in your spouse, right? softening his or her heart. And in fact, I just want to take a second to pray for you. If you're in a marriage that, uh, where your spouse is not a believer, I'm going to take a second and pray for you uh, right now. Uh, Father, I just want to pray for those who are in a, a marriage like that where maybe their spouse doesn't come to church with them or, or they, they're not yet following Jesus. I pray you'd give them uh, courage and um, just the, the ability to continue uh, pressing on, to continue following you and loving uh, their spouse as you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're married, uh, following Jesus looks like staying married, uh, loving Jesus and loving your spouse like Jesus loved you. But if you're single, Paul says, don't do it. Uh, don't marry an unbeliever. He says in verse 39 at the end of the chapter, a wife is bound to her husband as long as she is living. But if her husband dies, she's free to be married, uh, 
to marry anyone she wants, but only in the Lord. Only to marry someone in the Lord, uh, someone following Jesus. And 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be yoked together with those who do not believe. Now, of course, this isn't the only criteria in a good future marriage partner. Uh, Before I was married, I went on a few dates with Christian women uh, who, after the date, I thought I'd rather stay single. (laughs) So there there are a lot of crazy Christians out there. Uh, Just because they're a Christian doesn't mean it's wise to marry them, but... Uh, a shared faith commitment is foundational and fundamental. And it makes sense, doesn't it? All right, when you marry someone, you become one with them. So a following Jesus is the most important part of your life, but it's not your spouse's priority. You won't be able to share the most important part of your life with your spouse. And then throw kids into the mix and how to raise them, church or no church. That's not fair to you, and that's actually not fair to your unbelieving spouse either. Marriage is hard enough as it is, but without that shared foundation, without being able to pray together, man, it gets even more difficult. So Paul says if you're not married, don't marry an unbeliever, uh, but if you are married, uh, stay married if at all possible. But of course, sometimes we do get to the point where it's not possible anymore. Or to use Jesus's language, some more red letters you probably can't see, uh, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. Again, God's heart is for healthy, lifelong marriage, but we live in a broken and fallen, hard-hearted world. Sometimes divorce is the lesser of two evils, sometimes a very necessary lesser of two evils. What are some of the conditions that might release you from a marriage, biblically speaking? Uh, the The big three biblical reasons are adultery, abandonment, and abuse. So in Matthew 19, 9, Jesus says that sexual immorality could release you from a marriage. In 1 Corinthians 7, 15, we read earlier, Paul says that someone abandoning you could release you from that marriage. And then um, in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, it says that um, a brother or sister is not bound in such cases. And that third category, in my opinion, uh, abuse could apply, could release you as well, based on that phrase, uh, in such cases. Uh, Theologian Wayne Grudem argues, uh, for example, that that phrase encompasses cases where someone has done something that so violates the marriage vow that, like serious abuse, that the spouse is free uh, to leave. Now, notice that none of these things necessarily require you to get a divorce. I've seen many marriages survive all three of these things. Some of your marriages have survived one of these things, and, and then they've gone on to thrive. It's actually one of the most beautiful and like Christ-like things that I've ever witnessed. But of course, very often, adultery and abandonment and abuse will kill a marriage. And they become, in my opinion, valid reasons to uh, divorce. Andrew Wilson offers some real helpful words of advice, pastoral advice in his commentary. Uh, I think he has three three pieces of advice here. First is if you're going through a challenging situation, uh, to submit to local church leadership, uh, to wise and godly counsel. He says, your pastors and elders are not perfect. Amen. (laughs) But they've been given to you by God to help with exactly these sorts of situations and their distance from a situation should enable them to see the best way forward more clearly than those who are directly involved. Uh, Some of you know that we have elders here. Elders don't just mean the old people in the church. Uh, They mean uh, our church leaders. So we have Rod and Andy, Chuck and Jeff uh, that, that are here for you, and, and, and I'm here for you. Uh, we have women on staff too, like our staff counselor, Tani, and there's many godly women in this room that you could talk to as well. Uh, get wise counsel. Uh, two, distinguish between short-term solutions and long-term commitments. So for example, if a spouse or children are in any kind of danger, we want to get them out of that situation immediately and probably involve law enforcement. But 
in terms of getting a divorce, biblically speaking, or like, am I in a healthy place to remarry? Uh, these are the longer term commitments that should be kind of engaged in or processed more slowly. Third, uh, when it comes to remarriage, Pastor Wilson says, if in doubt, stay unmarried. This is Paul's counsel to all of us in this chapter, not just those who have been divorced. So marriage is a big deal, and remarriage is an even bigger deal. Your second and third marriage are far more likely to end in divorce than your first one. I think I've told this story before, but it's kind of like the guy who wanted my dad to officiate his third marriage. And my dad said, well, I mean, okay, only if we go through some premarital counseling. And the guy's like, why do we need to do that? We've been married before. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You need double, dude. (laughs) But before all of this, behind all of this, uh, what is maybe the most fundamental reason that divorce happens? Is it irreconcilable differences? A lack of compatibility? We just grew apart. We fell out of love. They're not my soulmate anymore. Um, I think it comes down to one word. Neglect. Neglect. Maybe this is why 70% of women, or 70% of divorces are initiated by women these days. I think so often they notice a neglected marriage before we as men do. And I think there's also maybe a lie at work in our culture that women will be more happy when liberated from traditional responsibilities, which I don't think is necessarily true. But all unhealthy marriages start with neglect. Inattention, apathy, indifference, carelessness, thoughtlessness. I know I used to drive hours and hours to see Karina for like a few minutes. Every waking moment was dedicated to her and all my money was spent on her. But today, sometimes we sit in the same room and scroll for hours and don't talk to each other. We take our spouse for granted, don't we? We stop dating our spouse. We stop pursuing them. We stop getting flowers or writing little love notes. We stop doing the things that we know will make their day. We stop valuing them. There's two questions that I think ought to haunt us as married people. Uh, The first is this, is my spouse thriving? And I'm not sure how right this is, but sometimes I look at a languishing spouse and I wonder how much the other spouse is somewhat responsible for that. Or I see a thriving spouse and I can't help but think well about the person that they're married to. Again, that's obviously not an exact science because we're responsible for our own life and health, but man, I think there's something to that. And then the follow-up question to this question uh, is this, is my spouse thriving uh, because of me or in spite of me? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we should be asking ourselves that a lot. Is my spouse thriving because of me or in spite of me? Uh, Am I an impediment to their their life, joy, and peace, and purpose? Or am I like boosting, uh, blessing, reinforcing, and encouraging them? Is my spouse thriving because of me or in spite of me? So what's the antidote to divorce, to unhealthy uh, marriages? The antidote to divorce is not just saying, don't do it. Sometimes that's the extent of the church's witness on this question, right? Just don't get divorced. It's like, okay, cool, but why? How? Or what's the alternative? Divorce or unhappy marriage? No. The antidote to divorce is healthy marriage, thriving marriage, which takes work and not neglect. Uh, Real quickly, I want to honor who's been married the longest in the room. So if you've been married for 30 years or more, stand up. Yeah, we can give that a round of applause. I love that. All right, how about uh, 35 years? 40 years. Ooh, 45 years. Oh, love it. 50 years. A half a century? 55 years? Okay, well, okay, well, we got to figure this out. <laughs> All right, 50, 50, stand back up, 50. 
Stand back up 50 years. All right. Uh, Lynn, you're not sure? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, how many years do you guys? Yeah. 51. 51? Love that. 51? 53? All right. So you guys are the winners. We just want to publicly honor you guys. Go out to a nice dinner at the Twisted Cork. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys. As a church, we, we just look up to you guys and thank you for being a model of someone we could follow. And I hope I, hope I get there. I hope we get there. Love that. Yeah, how can I invest in my spouse? Uh, how can I uh, help stave off neglect and pursue them? Uh, let's talk to the husbands for a second. Uh, Paul gives four simple ways. They're not easy, but they're simple in Ephesians 5. Uh, nourish, cherish, wash, and sacrifice. First, nourish. He, uh, Ephesians 5, 28. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. You ever go to the gym and see the gym bros like flexing in the mirror and like taking, taking real good care of their body? I think that's kind of the image. Like you're just taking such good care of your spouse like you, like you do your own body. John Tyson says, all of us need an ongoing source of encouragement and care in our lives. Someone who will pay attention to the inner longings of our heart, nurture our callings, Tend to our wounds and feed our dreams. Be this for your wife. So nourish, uh, two, cherish. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And I like that word cherish better than the word love. We say, I love you a lot, but do we cherish our wife? Husband, does your wife feel loved, cherished, and valued? And the only person who can answer that question is not you, right? It's her. She's, she's the only one who can answer that question. Tyson points out sensitively that this is especially important as our wife ages and experience insecurity and impossible beauty standards, a society obsessed with youth. Cherish your wife for who she is and not who she was. Cultivate joy and gratitude, says Tyson, for the woman she has become and the thousands of choices she has made to do life by your side. Cherish. Third is to wash. And no, this isn't referring to a romantic bubble bath. <laughs> but we saw last week, the Bible approves, right? But verse 26 says, no, washing of water by the word. By the word, what does that mean? It's the idea of showering your wife with words of truth and encouragement. It's so easy to drown in false words. You're not a good enough mom. You're not a good enough wife. You're not pretty enough. And many of these lies come back to you're not enough. Perhaps more importantly, am I showering my wife with Jesus' words? What does God say about her? It's like, honey, you are loved by Jesus. You are a daughter of the king. Uh, babe, you're a new creature in Christ, a really hot one. Right? <laughs> so nourish, cherish, wash, and fourth sacrifice. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus died for the church. He gave everything for us. So husbands, we should constantly be asking what we can give up on behalf of our wives, not what we can get from them. Well, how about the ladies? Ladies, how can you help your husband thrive? It's similar, but slightly different. Uh, submit, honor, and support. So these are the three biblical commands for you. First, submit. Uh, Ephesians 5.24, now as this church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Now, I didn't really want to include this one, but I read it like six times in the New Testament, and I feel like that would not be right for me to pass over it. Uh, this does not mean you have to do everything your husband says. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't have an opinion, uh, particularly if he's being selfish, and you always obey God over man. 
but just like husbands are supposed to sacrifice themselves for their wives, uh, wives are called to do something similar, uh, to submit their perspective and pride and desires, uh, to, to humble yourself and to defer to his leadership. And this is always voluntary. It's never forced on uh, a wife. I had to ask our staff counselor, Tani, about this because I, I, I was a little uncomfortable navigating these waters. But she says that in her own marriage, that whenever her and her husband disagree, she's very clear with him about her opinion. And she asks her husband to pray about it. Like, should I buy this motorcycle? And, <laughs> and, and maybe that's a bad example. But, so she, she asks him to pray about it. And she says, you know, most of the time, if we pray about it, like, we kind of come to the same place. But if he still wants to do this or that after that, then she defers to him. Now, this is going to be very complicated and different depending on your relationships, but it is a command that we need to reckon with in the, in the Bible. Second, maybe more fundamental and maybe more important, is the idea of honor. Ephesians 5.33. To sum up, each of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. We live in an age of contempt, an honor deficit culture, and if you watch commercials, uh, guys are portrayed as idiots, aren't we? And so women, it's so easy to criticize and critique and scorn your husband, uh, but it does so much damage, especially if it's in public. But scripture says, respect your husband uh, to build him up with words which have such power. And have you noticed that what gets rewarded gets repeated? Uh, Men so powerfully respond to real admiration, real appreciation, real praise. I think it was Mark Twain who said, I could live two weeks on a good compliment. I could live two weeks on a good compliment. It's like, honey, I'm proud of you. Honey, I appreciate you. I hope our son becomes like you. Like, then watch him come alive with those kinds of genuine compliments. And ladies, you might find it amazing how little verbal affirmation and honor goes so far with us. Third and finally is this idea of support, supporting your husband. Genesis 2.18 calls the wife a helper, and helper does not mean inferiority or intern or assistant. Uh, It means something like military ally. Ladies, you are military allies, and that is a word, that word helper, that's used of God himself. That, that he is our helper. Kathy Keller says that she is to be your husband's most trusted friend and counselor. Uh, you, ladies, you are someone who comes alongside and, and helps and blesses. And we men need a lot of help, amen? <laughs> I know I do. Uh, what you, you know, uh, I know that generally speaking, uh, women connect more face to face and guys connect more shoulder to shoulder kind of a shared mission. And so maybe for some men, simply coming alongside and doing a project together, maybe without any conversation, might just mean a lot to him. But for all of us, right, what can you do this week to not neglect your marriage, but to make your spouse thrive with your words, with your mentality, with your actions, to nourish, cherish, wash, sacrifice, submit, honor, support. I'm going to invite the worship team back up and we're going to prepare our hearts for communion. And communion reminds us that marriage love is not ultimate. It's not. God's love is ultimate. Marriage is symbolic. It's a model of of something else, of a real thing. Just like a picture on Instagram, never quite fully kind of communicates the greatness of that moment, a waterfall, a sunset, like as being there in person. So marriage is an imperfect picture of God's love for us, his commitment to us, his pursuit of us. Maybe you're not married and you wish you were. Maybe you are married and wish you weren't. May that that dissatisfaction drive you to the love of God. Jesus laid down his life for you and for me to bring us back to God. So married or not, all of life is about knowing him. Let's drink to that as we uh, take communion. We'll take communion after this next song. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, we know that this is such a a painful and sensitive issue. Uh, 
this is some of the worst experiences of some of our lives that we're talking about this morning. And again, impossible to uh, nuance everything perfectly. But Lord, I do pray that we would, um, yeah, be a place, a church that loves marriage, that just supports uh, couples that are doing well or struggling, and also a place that loves and welcomes those who um, come out of broken homes and broken marriages. Uh, Lord, help us to take responsibility for the ways that we've uh, contributed to the decline of our marriages. And uh, Lord, thank you for your love for us, that when we mess things up, and we do often, that you're still there. You love us, uh, and, and we love each other as a church. Uh, thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.